Is Florida State going to be stuck in the ACC for two more years? You are Locked On ACC, your daily podcast on the Atlantic Coast Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked on ACC. Thank you so much to the everydayers for making us your first listen and your first watch today. I'm Alex Dono from Locked on Canes. He is Kenton Gibbs from Locked on Wolfpack. On this episode, we are going to dissect a top 10 player ranking within the ACC. That's the on the field stuff. With the off the field stuff, I want to talk about whether or not North Carolina, UNC, is fully leaning in or not to actually wanting to leave the conference. But yes, we know Florida State and Clemson are leaning in to try to leave the conference. Now, Kenton, uh, I don't think anyone can say for sure. I know that there's people online who claim to know exact dates when Florida State is going to – I we agree that they are going to leave the ACC. Yeah. Now, some people yeah. claim to know exactly when that's going to happen. I don't think anyone truly knows just based on the fact that there are so many legal uncertainties right now with multiple lawsuits at play. The ACC is currently involved in a total of five – lawsuits, including suits and countersuits with Clemson, suit and countersuit with Florida State, and they're getting sued by the uh, the attorney general within the state of Florida. So there, there's a lot of balls being juggled right now in this regard. Now, as far as what we know about what the timeline could look like, we did Kenton talk yesterday. Uh, Andrea Adelson from ESPN kind of laid out at least what the Florida State uh, board of Trustees would like to see in terms of a timeline, uh, t- uh, Timeline, excuse me, trustee Justin Roth asked last August for an exit plan to leave the ACC by August of 2024. That has led some people to wonder if Florida State might at least formally declare by August that they are leaving the conference. Uh, something else on the timeline is, has come up, uh, Kenton. And again, these are these are possibilities. Nothing is set in stone right now. Uh, right. But the X account, uh, Genetics56, who goes by Big Ten Information, uh, you've probably seen his stuff if you follow college football realignment. He's been full of information and opinions on the matter. Uh, he sent out on uh, uh, early this week, small but important FSU update, he said on Tuesday. Confidentiality is important and will be respected by me. With that said, as of right now, I'm not aware of FSU playing a 20 tw- 2025 schedule in another conference earliest word still remains 2026 if anything changes i will let you know so as of right now he has no reason to believe we have no reason to believe that florida state will be in another conference for the 2024 season the 2025 season maybe 2026 at the earliest so that's so interesting to me and uh i have a sign of my own here uh to let people know something Locked on ACC is targeting 2025 for the year that Kenton Gibbs starts dating Megan Thee Stallion. Okay. Um, since we're Not all 2024, <laughs> no, 2025, we got to get our ducks in a row. We got to get our duckets right, you know, and, and we got to make sure that we're in Houston at the same time as the Houston hottie, as they like to call her, so we can work it out. Since we're just saying things, Dono, because, you know, this feels a lot like the doomsday folks who just keep throwing predictions of when the world is going to end at you. And it's like, knock it off, dude. Knock it off. Because remember, we were originally told, oh, well, it's going to be over. And Florida State's played their last game in ACC in February. In February, people were saying that. To which I said, that is preposterous. That's not how any of this works. I'm sorry to tell you, which you and I have both talked about, even if they were to fully get out of ACC, every other Power Fives team schedule is set in such a way that they could not just, even if they wanted to, say, hey, we're in the SEC now, so we're an SEC team. That's all there is to it. But, you know, it is what it is, and, and here we are looking at this moment now. But I, I will say this. A 2026 exit aligns with where I think the court case will most likely be over and done with. Because, again, you know, you and I both talked about it. And, again, I, I, I promise you I still have my robe and cigarette ready. Still got them ready. I'm sorry, not cigarettes, cigar, not cigarette. You don't smoke cigarettes to celebrate. <laughs> Robe and cigar prepared for, uh, what was it, June 1st or is it July 1st? Which date is July it? 1st. it? July 1st. July 1st when this happens. Because, again, you know, there's, there's a lot of information floating around, a lot of bad information. But, again, you have to keep in mind 
nothing can change until the courts are at least somewhat settled. And right now, the court situation is mucky, troubled waters. This is not clear, smooth sailing, I can see to the bottom type of water. This is not what we're looking at here. So with a lot more coming out, with a lot more to be done in these cases, I, you and I both believe we're not delusional. We're not like, you know, you're going to be in the ACC forever until 2036. They're going to leave early. But again, they'll be here through at least 2026 is my prediction as well. Yeah, and you know the 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 uncertainty that could change this because there are variables here. Again, nothing is for certain. Like we can sit here and say, probably twenty twenty six is when this would happen. But um, I am definitely open to the possibility of something happening before then. Because one thing we don't yeah, know, and again, there are people who claim to know about things happening behind the scenes in terms of settlement talks. Right there, there are some people you see them on X, you see them on message boards who claim, you know, they're already kind of broaching settlement talks and maybe Florida State and Clemson could get out sooner than you think. Um, I, I, I wouldn't rule anything out, Kenton. I just feel like we're, we're, we're so in the early stages in the courts in North Carolina and the courts in Florida. I don't know if we've advanced to the point where settlement talks would be anywhere near a conclusion. Like I'm, I'm open to that possibility, but I haven't had any, you know, the white smoke coming out of the Vatican. I haven't had anything like that. No smoking gun that would tell me something's going to happen within a matter of weeks or months. Yeah. And, and here's the thing, right? As this thing proceeds through court, I can be a thousand percent honest to saying that my sources close to this have been opening up more about timelines. But even with that, I haven't gotten many specifics. And what I do know, what I do know is, again, what we predicted was right in terms of court moving slow. Everybody loves to think that this is, I, I want you to think about this in terms of relative speed, okay? In Leon County, Florida State was sent back and told, hey, redo your argument, yada, 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 so on and so forth. And then in Mecklenburg County, the ACC is told, hey, we're not doing anything until your until the uh, the higher court decides what's whether or not to stay or continue listening, right? The Leon County one, has Florida State submitted a completely retooled argument yet? I don't believe so. And yet we already know that timeline-wise, they're going to be ahead of the Mecklenburg County one. How do we know yeah. that? Yeah. How do we yeah, know that, right. right? Because when you understand how courts work at just a low fundamental level, right, we're not talking about getting into the weeds of, hey, this is when you get sequestered and this is when this happens, this is... We're not getting into the, the weeds of, of mediation and what that means. We're talking very low level stuff in terms of how courts move. Again, this is going to be a process. This is going to be a process. So I need, and, and Florida State fans, I know I've made fun of you all to some degree. I know I have, but I'm, this is me reaching out with empathy. You know, I was told, my mother said I was being unkind. I love you, mama. I know you're listening. So I'm, I'm trying to be kinder now. I'm leading with empathy. I understand you want to get out. I understand you have been one of the leaders in this conference in terms of viewership, in terms of championships, in terms of all the things. You've been a better carrier. Please, let's, let's live in reality together. Let's come to reality together. You and I may not agree on why the reality is what it is. What we can agree on is, objectively speaking, the courts will not be settled out and done as quickly as most people thought they would be. Because, mind you, there was a large contingent of folks who thought the last game in ACC had already been played. And then it was, well, uh, I don't see if there's any way, shape, form, or fashion that they go into this season, even if they do play a full ACC schedule as a member of ACC. And as we clearly are seeing from everybody who's close to this, that's going to be the case. So, again, Florida State fans, Knowles fans, I'm with you. You know, Donald's a Miami guy. He's with you, too. We're all here yeah, with sure. you. Let's just let's just go in reality together. Yeah, because I, I, honestly, like when you strictly look at the common sense of the revenue splits with big programs around the country, if you simplify it to that point, it's not that simple because, you know, Florida State did sign and agree to this grant of rights. Now, the question yeah. is, it, has the ACC been acting in good faith? Like the ACC yeah. has been acting yeah. primarily a, as an engine of self-preservation, which is maybe good for conference leadership not good for the teams within so if florida state can find a way to punish them in court for that power to them because the, if you simplify this kenton 
based on you know what Florida State polls and revenue, TV ratings, performance on the field, they deserve better than you know a, a 30% revenue gap compared to teams within the SEC and Big Ten that are doing similar and even lesser numbers in some cases. Like they deserve Absolutely. better than that. Clemson probably does as well. There are other programs within the ACC that probably deserve better than what they're getting. So if you simplify it to the to that form, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people could, you know, probably root for them to win on on that level. And I know it's difficult for me to say root for Florida State in anything, but it's also it, it's fascinating to see if if they or Clemson can find a way out. You know what that would mean for other schools within the conference. Now, uh, I do want to talk about a because uh, I know I know Kenton, you and I are, are pretty opinionated about the top players in the ACC coming up. College Football News put out a, a pretty awesome ACC primer preview for the upcoming football season, including their ranking of the top ten football players in the ACC. Who did they leave out of their list? Anybody in there that shouldn't be in there? And yeah, we are going to talk a little bit more about North Carolina on this episode because I, I did watch some of uh, of the stream uh, of their uh, board of trustees meeting, and there's a lot of unhappy folks about that budget. Are they going to fully lean in to getting out of the conference? My friends, we're not done yet. You want to keep it locked right here on this brand new episode of Locked on ACC. And I already know you are keeping it locked to eBay Motors. Passion, drive, patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you will always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Thank you so much for making this episode of Locked on ACC your first listen and your first watch today. We're free wherever you get your podcasts. We're available free on YouTube. We're part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. Alex Dono from Locked on Canes. Kenton Gibbs from Locked on Wolfpack. So, uh, you know, Kenton, we were we were looking through this uh, this ACC primer, this preview for the upcoming season from College Football News, CFN, and they they put out their ranking of the, in their opinion, the 10 best ACC players. Uh, do you want, should I start from number one or should I start from number 10 to work my way up for a little more, a little more suspense? Let's start from 10 and work to one. Let's make the people wait for the top guys. I like it. So, all right, one of the one of the new teams in the ACC this coming season is Stanford. Now, Stanford didn't have a good year, but they do have a really, really good wide receiver, Alec Io Manor. Uh, I've been working on his name all day, and you know what, Kenton, watching some of his exploits from last season, it's wide receiver from Stanford. Uh, you don't have to look much. Now, I know Colorado didn't play a lot of defense last year. I get it, but this young man still had. 13 grabs for almost 300 yards. It was 294 yards on 13 catches and three touchdowns in that overtime thriller against Colorado last year. Um, right. Honestly, uh, I, again, I know his team's not been very good, but Io Manor, maybe he deserves to be even higher than number 10. That is a stud wide receiver. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. I like I am an or a lot. I like him. I like him. And I think that he does have potential and that was held back by lackluster quarterback play. That's that's yeah. me being quite honest. However, Ashley I Daniels, think, yeah, not good. I think there were better receivers in the conference that did not make the list. And you know, we'll 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 get there at the end of this because I don't want to let you know who didn't make the list that I think was a very clear replacement for him in this 10 slot. But hey, it's it's the list as it goes, and we're starting off. A little bit of controversy already. So, you know, this is this is the season where they get these lists going and they get get folks like me and Donald's blood pressure all up already. So I'm going to let Donald keep rolling on the list because I don't want to take up too much time. Here. Well, at number nine, uh, we, we have a, a tr the first transfer player. There are mm -hmm. a few, but the first transfer player on this list 
is one, uh, Kenton, you are familiar and you're going to become a lot more familiar come September. Grayson McCall, the new quarterback for the NC State Wolfpack, took his talents from Coastal Carolina to Raleigh, North Carolina to NC State. Uh, I, I really liked what I saw from McCall at Coastal Carolina. Excellent, quick release, good field general, uh, and I think he's going to do well with with all the weapons he's now got with uh, the Wolfpack. Yeah, I absolutely think that the Wolfpack have one of the most underrated um, pass catching groups in America, and that's you know, when you talk about nobody mentioning them seriously, when you think about NC State, everybody wants to talk defense, defense, defense. I am telling you, this group of wide receivers, tight ends, and running backs, yeah. it's it's unlike anything seen in Raleigh since Torrey Holt and Jericho Cotri were on the same team catching passes there. Wow. Well, uh, I and I almost I, I kind of and maybe this is too much of a of a preview for the rest of the list, but I I, I thought at least one of uh, his wide receivers should have made the list. But uh, we move on. Number eight, new quarterback at Florida State, DJ Uyunglele makes the list. Uh, this is a a former now again ACC player was with, was with Clemson for the first couple of years of his career. Spent last season at Oregon State. Now he's at Florida State uh, again. Like, I think Florida State's going to be really, really good. I don't know yeah. if the quarterback is going to be the engine that that drives them to being really, really good. So we'll, we'll see what happens. DJU is very experienced, though. The And this is – the more I think about it and the more I watch DJU play, because, yeah, we're in that time of the season where all you got to do is sit around and watch all 22 and, you know, some highlights here and there. The more I'm starting to think DJU is getting too much love, that, that – that spear on the helmet is giving him a big push that he would not receive otherwise. He would not be receiving this type of love if he transferred into Pitt, per se. He wouldn't be receiving this type of love if he transferred into UVA. If he transferred into uh, – Syracuse has got a little bit of hype, but even if he transferred into there, I don't think he'd be getting this – well, never mind. According to later in the list, I guess he would. But, you know, there's – there's I, I'm, I'm starting to think DJ is getting a little overrated here, but we shall see. Wow. Okay. So let's move up the list. Uh, another one who's uh, part of one of those new teams in the conference, uh, running back from Cal, Jaden Ott. Uh, he put up insane, I think over 1,500 yards last year at Cal. Like Ott, Ott is a player. He's going to be one to watch this year in the ACC. The kid is nasty. If you don't know who Jaden Ott is, I'm telling you, uh, especially for the teams that have to play him, get familiar. Get familiar because he can do it all on the football field. And I'll tell you what, beyond his ability as a uh, as a back that has carried an offense and been a feature back in a time where you often think about, hey, this the new world of football is all about these um, all about throwing the ball, all about spreading it out. Jaden Ott is a back that has legitimately everything. He has speed, he has power, he has balance, he is shifty, he can catch it out of the backfield. I am surprised that Jay Knott is not talked about more in terms of the running yeah. back one conversation for next year's draft. I believe he's a sophomore, or I believe he's a sophomore going into junior this year. So I'm surprised that more people aren't talking about him as running back number one for next year um, coming out because, again, he looks special. I, I really can't think of anything where I'm like, man, if you ask him to do that, he's going to struggle mightily that you would ask out of an NFL back. All right, so moving up uh, now for, again, uh, for Florida State, I, I think it's going to be their defense that's going to be a driving force this year. And they have edge rusher Patrick Payton at number six. Payton last year, seven sacks, two forced fumbles. Uh, he's definitely a guy that opposing offenses have to game plan for. Absolutely. And the question for him is, how is it in the AC, right? So for those of you who don't know, there's a difference between your, your top pass rusher and your second top pass rusher if they're both edge rushers, right? Your top pass rusher, that's the guy the team's playing for. They game plan around. They function around. We have to neutralize him. If we can neutralize him, everybody else will kind of take care of itself because we got scholarship guys too. He was one of those everybody else guys because they had this fun guy named Jared Burst or something or another. He was pretty good, that first kid. So he was in – and then on top of that, you got Braden Fisk as well to draw more heat off of you. This year, he's going to probably be the A guy there. I know that they've got another fantastic transfer on the other edge Marvin there. Marvin Jones. In Marvin Jones, but I'm telling you, he is very likely to be in that AC at least to start the season off. 
how will he perform? Is he ready to step up into that mode? We'll see. So at number five, uh, this is one that I, I know very well, like one of the most uh, professional college players I've ever covered. I mean professional in the way he conducts himself on and off the field. Uh, Miami's leading receiver, who, who's back for his senior season, Xavier Restrepo, had a had a thousand yard campaign playing in the slot. Uh, he, he he was able to put up big numbers, you know, despite some inconsistencies from Tyler Van Dyke, who was actually his best friend and, and former roommate. And Restrepo, uh, I know it's early. He looks like he and Cam Ward are very much on the same page. Had a good spring together. Uh, worked out a lot uh, on and off the field. Uh, so you know, Restrepo. I know that some people will just because he, you know, he's about six foot slot receiver. He doesn't look like a prototypical NFL guy. I'm sure a lot of people will look at that list and say, "Really, him in the top five? Uh, we'll see. At almost 1,100 receiving yards last year, I think with Cam Ward, he can have an even better year this coming year. If you don't believe that Xavier Restrepo belongs on this list, turn on the film. Just turn yeah. on the film. Watch him work. He received one of the greatest accolades a receiver ever can. You know what that is? Your quarterback said, ah, forget it. He's down there somewhere. And the, yeah. the forget it probably is not a forget it. It's it's probably a one-syllable word that rhymes with puck. But that's the reality. <laughs> that's that's what you saw plenty of times with TVD. He was like, ah, safe is down there yeah. somewhere. And that, that means that he's earned that type of trust. As again, he's not the biggest guy in the world. Is he big for a slot receiver? Yes. He is for a slot receiver. But if you're talking about jump ball, true, like, hey, go up and get it, he's not that prototypical size. He yeah, runs he's got crazy vert, yeah. He runs efficient, clean routes, and he can jump out the gym with excellent body control. He goes up and gets the ball. He plucks it out of the air with the type of strength that you're not expecting from a slot receiver. The guy's special. All right, so at uh, at number four, this was someone I know we mentioned to him being in the conversation of potential ACC Defensive Player of the Year coming up, and that's uh, defensive end Ashton Gelati from Louisville. Uh, he cracks that top four, Ken. Oh, oh man. I, imagine Wolverine on a football field. Imagine, yeah. right? You don't have to imagine too long. He wears number nine, and he wears red for Louisville. Ashton Gelati is relentless. He is not only relentless – that defense knows that he's the heart and soul of the deal because, again, turn on the film. They Louisville specializes in finding your weakest offensive lineman. Said, "Hey, number nine, go hunt. Yeah, go, go have fun with that guy. That's your dance partner. Swing your partner round and round. You and him all day long doing the dosey do because that's again, he is that special of a pass rusher. He is explosive. He's getting to watch his development as a pass rusher from where his hand fighting was." two years ago or so to where it was by the end of last season, it's like day and night. He used to win before off sheer explosiveness and effort. Now he's added in technique. He's added in an understanding. Obviously, he can get a little bit more bendy, a little bit more flexible, but I'm telling you, he is a really, really good pass rusher, good against the run too, a lot better than most people would think at his size. He's he's a very, very good candidate for defensive player of the year in the ACC. We'll get into the top three when we come back and also talk about maybe some players who could or should have been on the list. My friends, you want to keep it locked right here. Alex Dono and Kenton Gibbs with you on Locked on ACC. Folks, the only ticket service that I use is game time. Because not only do they have everything I need, but the prices get better the closer you get to the event. Guys, I'm a procrastinator. I admit that. And game time is the perfect spot if you're like me. Guys, the NBA playoffs are going on. Stanley Cup playoffs. I'm so excited. Game time is an authorized ticket marketplace of the NBA, which makes getting playoff tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the game time app actually go down the closer it gets to tip off. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat and their lowest price guarantee, game time takes the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets. The all in pricing is a game changer. Guys, they show you exactly what you're going to pay up front. They don't tack on those hidden fees at the end that you may you despise those as you should. You don't get anything like that on game time. The panoramic views from your seat, they show you exactly what you're going to be looking at and from, from what angle. And guys, the game time guarantee means if you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time is going to credit you 110% of the difference. So take the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets with game time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, 
Create an account and redeem code locked on college for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Thank you so much for making this episode of Locked on ACC your first listen and your first watch today. So, uh, so far in that CFN top 10 ACC player ranking, uh, Kenton and I both pronounce his name a different way. Uh, I think everybody does it. Number 10, uh, Alec Iomanar, Iomanar, the wide receiver from uh, Stanford. He's really good. That's all you have to know. At number nine, Grayson McCall, NC State quarterback, Florida State quarterback, DJ Uyunglele at number eight, Cal running back, Jaden Ott at number seven. Florida State Edge, Patrick Payton at number six. Miami receiver Xavier Restrepo at number five. Louisville defensive end Ashton Gelati at number four. Uh, they go defense again, Clemson at number three, and that's Barrett Carter, linebacker from Clemson. Do you agree with his top three placement? You know, I'm not going to lie. He let me down last year, uh, starting off the year especially. Things looked rough. Things looked rough. He talked about being out of shape a little bit and having to play his way into shape, which is really a concern for me. Um, that's always because conditioning is between is between you and you. However, with all of that said, he's a freak athlete. He really is. He is the type of athlete, you know, everybody looks at the play where he jumped over a running back while blitzing uh, to get home. And that's part of what makes him special. Another part is he's really starting to come on in terms of intuitiveness and understanding of the linebacker position. You know, this is he's. He's getting better and better. And again, if he comes into this season in shape, ready to go, you know, a little bit, a little bit stronger, a little bit more able to hold the point. He is truly a sideline to sideline guy, which I think is an overused term, but it fits him perfectly. Yeah. All right. So at number two, um, I'm not going to argue with this one, Kenton. Amari and Hampton running back out of North Carolina. This was another beast at running back who rushed for over 1,500 yards last season. And this season, without Drake May, I think he's going to be an even bigger part of that NC offense. Brother, you're going to be the cash cow. You're going to be the bell cow. You're going to be the one to carry the mail. And if you can't get it done, Omarion, oh it will not get done, okay? It is not going to happen for that offense. But seriously, Omarion is another one a lot like Jay Knott. That he, he's a little bit shorter, a little bit stockier than Jay Knott, I believe. But he is a guy that has – he has it all. He has it all. He's shown himself to be a good receiving weapon. He's shown himself to be uh, a really, really good running back. When you put the ball under his arm and just say, don't go down, he's really good at that. He's really good at making guys miss in the open field. He has really good contact balance. It's like you combine – Williams and Carter, who were there a few years ago, into one guy, you'd get a mark. Yeah. So at, at number one on their list, probably a lot of folks have kind of realized this was coming just based on who's come off the board. And again, this this is not my list. This is uh, the college either. football news. I mean, probably also would have been number one on my list, but they go with Miami transfer quarterback Cam Ward. Comes in from Washington State, threw for 3,735 yards, 25 touchdowns, seven interceptions, nine rushing touchdowns last year. He comes to Miami with a lot of hype, high expectations, and and folks are, are really wondering about Ward. Is he going to be the best quarterback Miami's had in many years? Because, yeah, Miami has not found a lot of consistency, consistency at that position in a very long time. You know, everybody talks about the downsides of Cam Ward a lot, the turnovers and some of the mechanical issues, some of the decision-making yeah, issues. Yeah. There's there's a reason he keeps getting on the top of all these lists. Y'all do realize that, right? It's not often a quarterback has the potential to be the fastest player on the field, period. Cam is one of those guys. Not only is he that, the arm is live. It's not just yeah. live, it's accurate. He can put he can make those throws where you see the arm talent is there. With him, it's all about the decision making. But again, speed, arm talent, ability to make people miss, sort of like a, a, a wide receiver who's pretty good at breaking tackles. I wouldn't go as far as saying a running back is good at breaking tackles. If he had that, he probably would have been the number one pick in last year's draft. But you get yeah. the point. I think that he is a really, really good player that people are kind of over-indexing his problems into or over-indexing into his problems, that kid's special. He's a he's a special, special player. Him being that one makes sense to me. Now, when, I, when I'm thinking about who else could have been in this top 10 or should have been in this top 10, I actually, I'm going to do Kenton's homework for him because I, I felt like maybe a couple, couple of other NC State players 
could have gotten in. Aiden he White, it, for one. Me. He said it, not me. And I, and I mean it. NC State's top shutdown corner, Aiden White, I thought it could have been on the list. And then, yeah. you know, and, and I, I think I hyped this guy up even more than Kenton, but I'm a huge KC Concepcion fan. And, you know, I think about, because he he does he does a little bit, well, a lot of everything <laughs> for that NC State offense. I thought maybe there yeah. could have been a spot for Concepcion. And this is why, and with all due respect to um, Aya Menor, he is a, again, he's a really big body. He high points the ball well, physical, hard to bring down after the catch. If you look at the the total stats of those two, even if you go per game, because technically KC did play one more game because of the bowl game than Alec did, he still outperformed them as a true freshman. Like that, the game is only going to slow down more for him. That's year this year that we were looking at. This is Alex's sophomore year jump, right? This is that's what that looks like. That's what we saw out of Alex. We have not gotten that out of uh, Casey yet, nor did he redshirt. This, the game is only going to get slower for that young man. He's, oh, and by the way, he had more touchdowns than, uh, than Ayo Menor, and he had more touchdowns than the rest of NC State's team combined in terms of receiving touchdowns. I, I, I do remember that like, stat. Wow. Now, now that he has weapons next to him and teams just can't say, all right, we're going to cover him like it's a punt. Put two guys on him at the line of screen. We don't want him to breathe too freely. If he goes to the bathroom, we need one of you shaking it for him. Now that that's no longer the case, <laughs> I am telling you, he's going to show something. He's going to show you something, ACC. Keep your eyes peeled because he's going he's going to act a fool. And, and there, are, there are a few other players that I, you know, I'm not – I'm not going to say that it's the worst thing in the world that they're excluded because maybe they need that chip on their shoulder. But I'm going to tell you this. Two quarterbacks in particular that I look at and I'm like, mm, I'm not crazy upset that they didn't make the list, but they could have. you got to give my man Castellanos his love, and you have got to, got to, got to give Kyron Drones his love because I think both of those guys are. Yeah, They're not just yeah. quarterbacks that, like, their team's all right without them. Those two are guys, if they leave their teams – Neither one of their teams sniffs, comes close to, considers a bowl game. Halfley wouldn't have had a chance to leave his ass from Boston if if Castellanos wasn't what he is because they would have won about three games last year. So, you know, I, I think it's really interesting to leave those two off, but I get it. You don't want to put too many quarterbacks on the list. Fine. Right. Well, okay, so we still uh, – we, we did uh, discuss talking about – North Carolina and how much they're going to lean into leaving the conference. We'll we'll do a vertical tease. That that's a biz, you know, remark. We'll save that for tomorrow's episode. Alex Dono alongside Kenton Gibbs. Guys, make sure you smash that thumbs up. Uh, like this video if you're watching it on YouTube. If you listen to the audio version, make sure you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your pods. And we will talk to you again tomorrow on another episode of Locked On ACC, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day.